This is the most absurd story we've ever done. I, 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 I know, I want you to know I have, I have researched this and I know about these different organizations, but yes. who does a national team like? So the smallest nation with a national team recognized by FIFA is Montserrat. Its population is just a shade under 5,000 people. It's in the Caribbean. And we are not here to talk about Montserrat today. I just wanted to save you the Google. I, I do want to go there at some point for a video, but that's tomorrow's Zealand's problem. Today's Zealand's problem is much smaller. Because today we're here to talk about a country that's surface area is half the size of a regulation football pitch. I did not stutter. This country, the entire country, the entire entire nation is half the size of a soccer field. That's because Sealand is a former World War II fort built off the east coast of England that was simply never designed to be a country. I mean, that is the entire country. That's it. That is the whole thing right there. Now, granted, there are some rooms and those big cement things on the side, but this is not a very big place. To be exact, it's 0 .004 four square kilometers, which honestly I would have thought would be even smaller than that. Those square kilometers according to this BBC article, which I'm assuming they just walked the whole thing. This is probably about the time in the video where you start to wonder if I've just baited you with a wonderful thumbnail and title combination that was irresistible. Because surely, surely this country can't have a national team. Well then put your seatbelt on, because this self-proclaimed principality not only has a national team, it's played 12 senior international matches, and the story is as weird as you would expect. And it starts with the fact they've actually played 13 matches if you count their B-team match against Punjab. But no self-respecting YouTuber would include that in a video. I mean, it would be just journalistic malpractice to count that as one of their 12 senior international matches. Shame. As for the current population of Sealand, you're probably not surprised to find out it's very small. Just two full-time security guards. And oof, they only need nine more for a team. I don't know what the whole issue is. But hey, in the golden days, there were 50 people living in Sealand, mostly friends and family of the founding royal family, which now runs the country from off-site and actually resides in the holiness in England. They administer from afar. So that's where the only two full-time people on Sealand are the security guards there to defend against invasion. Although honestly, I shouldn't air quote that because that actually did happen. European mercenaries tried to take Sealand and the family actually successfully defended itself. The Sealand official website says that Michael, uh, Michael being the chief administrator, the prince of Sealand, has successfully defended Sealand from nine, in nine invasion attempts. I know it sounds like I'm making all this up. Up. But honestly, the more you research Sealand, the more you feel like that all of this should be made up. And I couldn't figure out whether I was researching a really cool, interesting story or just some giant long con publicity stunt orchestrated by one family who found a, a, an abandoned World War II fort in international waters and ran with it. And remember, we're still getting to how they ended up with a freaking national team, like that plays matches. But I will say what I don't think journalists that are covering this story are able to say, and that is that Sealand just represents a giant middle finger, either to Britain or just to authority in general and the idea of freedom and that there's a place in the world that you can go where you don't have Big Brother lording over you. The founder, this beautiful hunk of man named Patty Roy Bates, took the place over in the 1960s in order to run a pirate radio station from it. So it was all about subverting control anyways and doing what you wanted to do. Then a year after he got the place, he declared it the Principality of Sealand as a romantic gesture to his wife, Joan. Then he moved his entire family there, honestly. Worst places to grow up than the middle of the ocean. Then a year after that, the British Navy sent people to go destroy all of these forts in international waters that had been there for 20 odd years. And Sealand defended its sovereignty. It fired warning shots at the British Navy. That's shown in this article by Lad Bible and is a story corroborated in the other stuff that we researched for this piece. A UK court then ruled that since Bates was not in Britain when he committed the gun offense, that he didn't have to, to come in for the gun offense and thus the principality of Sealand was standing on its own two stone pillars. And there they have stayed for 56 years. They issue their own passports, they create their own currency, and they, they release books of their own stamps. So really the only thing that was missing was a national team to begin with. But where do you start when you don't have room for a field and there's only two people that live there full time? Like actually, how do you have a team when those are your starting conditions? Not really a way to improve them too much either. Well you don't, at least in 
a conventional way, but of course, nothing about Sealand is conventional. Nothing I've told you this entire video makes any sense, but it's all true. Because unlike this video we made about the Marshall Islands, Sealand is under no illusion that it's going to end up in FIFA one day. They're just trying to put a team together that can go on the field and compete wearing the kit of Sealand. And the recruitment is easier because of what Sealand represents. It's pirate radio roots, it's swashbuckling nature, it's independence, it's freedom. Uh, that's what attracts people to the cause. And in turn, those supporters, those fans around the world of Sealand are actually what keep it running. But I'm getting ahead of myself. How does the team actually do? Because their first ever games technically was arranged by a guy who worked in a Danish hotel back in 2004. <laughs> he found out about Sealand on the internet, got his mates from a, from a veterans team of like a fourth division Danish club to come together and play under the flag of Sealand. It was, it was about as unofficial as it gets. So they played a 2-2 draw against Orland back in May 2004. But, but I think it's widely accepted. Their first ever international came in May 2012 and they played a team from the Chagos Islands. And, and they played out a 3-1 defeat uh, to the Chagos Islands. So, you know, they put up a decent fight. Surprisingly, Sealand was actually admitted into the NF board, which governs teams that aren't in FIFA, but represent nations, dependencies, unrecognized states, minorities, stateless peoples, regions, and micronations. Not in FIFA, and one of those you can get into NF board, at least until 2013. But since 2013, the duty has fallen to Konifa, Konifa. Conifer. They try to become part of something called CONIFA, which is essentially a, an, uh, an organizing body for non-FIFA affiliated international football. So they kind of try and organize tournaments and representation for countries or disputed territories that do need a bit more publicity, a bit more awareness raised of their existence and their plight through football. Now, Sealand obviously don't qualify for that, really, because they don't really have a kind of tragic story to tell of displaced communities and things like that. Which honestly makes sense. We're talking about groups of people that are displaced, that have gone through a lot, that have very hard-nosed stories compared to Sealand, who just wants to slap a team together and kick a ball around, right? Now that Sealand's not in any competitive organization, there's no real competitive incentive, even in a non-FIFA sense for the national team to be around, which brings us to the logical explanation that it might be coming back anyways, or the logical explanation for it playing through 2014 in the first place. How much of the team is made up by this kind of PR grab to just get famous people to play for Sealand? Well, this is where the story gets a little bit, little bit strange because, you know, at some point in their, in their kind of two-year golden era of this football team. The team kind of split. It split in two. There was the team that was led by, by Neil Forsyth, who kind of wanted to turn it into a kind of PR thing for Sealand and, and have celebrities who had no connection to Sealand whatsoever. That felt like the most unofficial version of the Sealand national team. They played some charity matches, raised some money. They played against, I think, like a Fulham All-Stars 11 at Craven Cottage. Now, at the same time, Stubbs was taking a separate team uh, on tour around Europe to play other kind of unrecognized nations. I mentioned that the fans keep Sealand going. Well, that's actually a literal thing. Somebody has to pay for the maintenance and upkeep of Sealand and the two security guards that are there all the time. Michael Bates, who assumed the leadership of the company after the death of his father in 2012, runs a fishery, but the majority of the money that keeps Sealand going comes from sales of things to the fans themselves that support Sealand around the world. Everything from keychains to a lord or lady title to stamps to flags. I got a football jersey over here. You can be a duke or a duchess of Sealand for 500 pounds. But with that in mind, when I was asking if Sealand's national team is actually something of a publicity stunt. Uh, this is absurd, right? The population of the country is currently two, it maxes out at 50, and they have a national team. Like, like it, it is ridiculous that they've even tried to do this, and it's ridiculous to pretend that it's not ridiculous, right? Well, it's, uh, I guess it's kind of like a minor triumph of internet curiosity, really. I mean, Sealand on, in its own right is kind of survives on the fascination and curiosity of people all around the world. And the football team kind of exists on the same principle. Every manager they've ever had, every head coach they've ever had for this team has been drawn to it by finding Sealand on the internet and going, wow, what an incredible story. So it's a really wholesome way of getting into it. There's nothing more sinister about it um, than that. It's just pure curiosity and the novelty, really, which isn't a word I want to use lightly, but that is 
what kind of underpins the whole concept of the Sealand national football team. It is. It helps keep Sealand front of mind so that Sealand can continue to exist. It wouldn't exist without the notoriety that it has. But the publicity is not the whole point, because when you boil this whole story down to a freaking national team playing matches against other recognized national teams by some federation, Sealand has a national team because it wants to. And that's the whole spirit of the whole country. Doing things because you want to do them and not letting anybody else tell you that you can't. How about before their first game against the Chagos Islands, when the Sealand National Anthem was playing, which probably would have been the first time I'd heard it, of course I put my hand over my heart and looked extremely serious. I just all felt like that was part of what we were there for, just to acknowledge the silliness and then play football. This is a national team that's representing a decommissioned World War II fort that a family started squatting on and then declared its own principality and nobody has ever been able to get them off of it. The team hasn't played in nine years and the actual national team has a significantly larger population than the actual country. But don't count out this team for comeback. The son of Prince Michael, the ruler, Prince Liam, did say we've recently been in discussions about getting the team active again and the ideas being bandied about, maybe they'll play Monaco, maybe they'll play the Vatican, those are dream matchups for them. But it's not about the scheduling, the reason this national team has a chance to reboot, and the reason that it ever existed in the first place is because who doesn't want to throw on a shirt, play a senior international, have a kick around with some friends, then go get a beer and pizza after the game while embracing the swashbuckling middle finger to the establishment attitude that Sealand has always been about. And there are a bunch of people around the world willing to embrace that idea and improbably, impossibly it seems, that Sealand is here to stay and its national team is here to stay to provide a home for those people. Huge thanks to Adam for joining us in this video. You can check out his whole article in The Athletic in the description. It goes into great detail about the trials and tribulations of the national team. There are also all the other sources we used researching this video and in the video itself, including two terrific BBC pieces about the history of Sealand. And you can check those out later too if you want to keep your binge watching going. I mentioned it earlier, this is a video about the last FIFA recognized nation without a national team representing it. Come on, if Sealand's got one, figure it out! Sealand has one.